We just before getting started, I just for, first of all just want to say thank you. Thank you for sacrificing your time and your rest this morning to come out and to fellowship together, to um, dive into God's word and to, to grow together. Um, it's a privilege and I, that's how I look at it. It's a privilege to look into the law of the Lord to, um, and to fellowship with the saints. It's a privilege and it's something we don't really have a lot of time to do. So it's a, it's a blessing when we are able to take time out to do it. So with that being said, let's um, just bow our heads for a word of prayer because we can't do anything without him. Heavenly Father, we count it a blessing, a privilege, and, and we are so appreciative of all you are and all you do and what you allow us to do and what you do in spite of us through us. Bless us all. We all need the Lord. We need to hear from heaven, and we desire to obey that which we hear. Let us not be hearers only, but doers, happy doers, willing doers. And we just uh, ask you to just uh, bless, oversee, speak through me, Lord God, and to me, and to us all. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. Women in Need, um, just for those of you who do not know, actually was birthed in my living room on the telephone with my good girlfriend, Tony. <laughs> and I was uh, just talking about, just lamenting about the needs of women and that we mm -hmm. need to come together. We need to be appreciated. We need to have, we need rest because mm -hmm. we do so much for so many and uh, with so little time and somehow God stretches us and or we stretch ourselves and then he has to make up the difference right but we do this and that we need real true unadulterated Bible study that really dives deep in the word and not just scratch the surface and to really just study the law of the Lord so that we can be doers so we can stand up under the pressures that we as women endure and will face and and then so we can help each other along on this road. And so thus, Women in Need was birthed. The mission for what we, the acronym is WIN, the mission of WIN is to minister to the whole woman, spiritually, emotionally, uh, psychologically, and biblically, through prayer, support, fellowship, and the word. This endeavor is a collective mission, accomplished when we come together and are used by the Holy Spirit for each other after which we may then go out and help other women in need. And that is our mission here, um, is to first of all have our needs met through God's word and through, uh, so it's biblical and practical needs. And so normally I try to have something practical for the women at every meeting in which uh, we do today, so you can find it on the table and take it with you. But the most important thing is the biblical as well. So. And then our vision is, our, is to see women be empowered to stand up under the pressures of life without compromising solely depending on God and his word. And the only way that that happens is we must, we are it's incumbent upon us to hold one another accountable, to care enough to ask, to care enough to confront, care fronting, when it's necessary, if you know your, your uh, brother is, is, is uh, stumbling and you say nothing, whoa. Well. And so we're one each other's, we're each other's keepers and, and we care enough to say something and, um, and then have somebody to speak into our lives. So um, that's the mission, that's the vision, and that's the call. And so with that being said, today we're going to begin our study in, uh, uh, the, from the Biblical Counseling Keys by June Hunt from Hope from the Heart, the study on forgiveness, the freedom to let go. And what I did, I wanted to ask you <clears throat> a couple of questions because forgiveness is one of those things we will be dealing with until the king comes. <laughs> and so on one, in one way or another. And so I want to ask you this, have you ever found it hard to forgive someone for an offense? Have you ever um, found yourself not forgiving someone for an offense? Or you forgave, but you didn't really want to forgive them, but you did it anyway. Number two, the question is, have you ever offended someone and wanted forgiveness, but did not receive it? And the last question that I I'm asking is what does genuine <clears throat> repentance look like 
or sound like to you? What does genuine repentance sound like or look like to you? So those are some thoughts that I want you to ponder and maybe we'll deliberate about. But thus we're going to dive into forgiveness. Because it is such a vast topic, it is, it's, you, it's not something, it's you know, only a few letters in it, but it's very deep. And so with that being said, the etymology of the word forgiveness from the Old English, forgive fan or forgiven. This word is before the 12th century. One source says before 900. Marion Webster has it uh, defined as to give up resentment, to give up resentment of or claim to, uh, to claim to requital for, forgive or to grant relief from payment of, to forgive a debt. And requital is retaliation for wrong or an injury. So the second uh, definition that Merriam Webster has listed is to cease to feel resentment against an offender, to pardon someone, to forgive one's enemies, to grant them forgiveness. I like to say to let them go, let it, that's a letting go. Dictionary.com defines it like this, to grant pardon, to grant pardon for or remission. Love that word. To grant pardon for or remission of an offense or a debt. To absolve. And it's second, uh, secondly defined as to give up all claim on account of a debt or obligation. To give up all claim. But let's take a look at what the biblical definition is. Forgiveness is to pardon, remission, to grant freedom or forgiveness from a debt, a debt owed. It's not that they didn't owe it, but you have, you have canceled the debt. And some Bible verses that I wanted to give is Matthew 6 and 12 that talks about forgive us the wrongs that we have done as we forgive the wrongs others have done us. Matthew 6 and 12. And Luke 6 and 37, forgive and you will be forgiven. And then Matthew 6, 14 and 15, which says, for if you forgive men when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you don't forgive men their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. The year is 1944. Nazi Germany occupies Holland. An elderly watchmaker and his family are actively involved in the Dutch underground. By hiding Jew Jewish people in a secret room of their home, members of the Ten Boom family courageously helped Jewish men and children escape Hitler's roll call of death. Yet one fateful day, their secret is discovered. The watchmaker is arrested, and soon after being imprisoned, he dies. His tender-hearted daughter, Betsy, also cannot escape the jaws of death of the hands of her cruel captors. In the Nazi concentration camp, she perishes. And what about Cory, the watchmaker's youngest daughter? Will she live? And if so, will she ever be able to forgive her captors? those who caused the death of her father and her sister, while she is trying to survive the ravages of Ravensbrück. One of, her, one of Hitler's most horrific death camps, can anything sustain Cory Ten Boom? To what can she cling? Indeed, Cory does survive. Her God sustains her. She lives the truth of these words. False witnesses rise up against me, breathing out violence. I am still confident of this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord. Psalms 27, 12 through 14. Two years after the war, 
Corey is speaking at a church in Munich. She has come from Holland to a defeated Germany, bringing with her the message that God does indeed forgive. There, in the crowd, a solemn face stares back at her. As the people file out, a balding, heavyset man moves toward her. A man in a gray overcoat, a man clutching a brown felt hat. Suddenly, a scene flashes back in her mind. The blue uniform. The, the visored cap with its skull and crossbones. The huge room with its harsh overhead lights. The humiliation of walking naked past this man. This man who is now standing before her. You mentioned Ravensbrück in your talk. I was a guard there, he says. But since that time, I've become a Christian. I know that God has forgiven me for the cruel things I did there, but I would like to hear it from your lips as well. He extends his hand toward her and asks, Will you forgive me? Corey stares at the outstretched hand. The moment seems like hours as she wrestles with the most difficult decision she has ever had to make. Corey knows scripture well, but applying this passage seems to be too much. If your brother sins, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. If he sins against you seven times in a day and seven times comes back to you and says, I repent, forgive him. Luke 17, 3 through 4. What Corey Tim Boom experienced, and those of us who know the story of her incredible, incredible life, incredible that, that she lived through such a horrific time, and then her family was lost in that, and then the person who was a part of that, responsible for that, walks up to her and says, forgive me? Now, I want to just ask you, what about that is a problem? <laughs> what about that is a problem? I know for me, the problem is this. He may have said, forgive me. But what's the problem is he didn't say, I'm sorry. I was wrong. That's a problem to me when I read it. That he didn't say, I was wrong. I am ashamed of what I did. I am sorry. But to just say forgive me, just to say let me off the hook? Have you ever found it hard to forgive someone for an offense? What made it difficult? because um, I guess, you know, when you go through a cushy kind of life <laughs> and things are kind of very, you know, kind of pretty okay, you know, mm -hmm. um, you don't expect certain things to happen. I think for me that the biggest surprise was finding out that once coming to Christendom that forgiveness was going to be an issue within the church. I didn't, I expected outside the church, but I didn't expect it on the inside. Mm -hmm. And so that was a paradox that I was not, I wasn't prepared well for. And it took the word of God, nothing else, nothing, nothing, nothing short of that, mm -hmm. nothing more of that, nothing else. It was God's word speaking to me directly uh, regarding that. And, um, and it's funny how you, in those situations, you really want God to talk to you about that person, but he doesn't. He talks to you about you and uh, what he wants you to do in that situation. Mm -hmm. And so um, I have to admit that I, yeah, I, I have definitely found it hard to forgive someone for an offense and mostly because it's hard to trust somebody who has uh, done great damage. It's very difficult to, to trust. It's um, You feel like you need to protect and guard yourself from that. And even though you know that God says, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, I will repay. Um, <clears throat> you think you need to still guard yourself <laughs> and protect yourself in a way. 
But I think it has a lot to do with trying to understand what forgiveness is and what it is not. And uh, because of that, it, it can really cause a lot of um, unrest in our souls and spirits, in our minds, if we do not answer those questions. Because the scriptures tell us that as a man thinketh, so is he, one. And number two, that anything done outside of faith is sin. And so you need to, we need to deal with these issues so we can make certain that we're walking circumspectly. And I think for most of us who are growing in Christ, it's important that we are pleasing the Lord. It's important. We've been bought with a price. We are no longer our own. And so we want to be able to yield our members um, holy and acceptable unto God, which is our reasonable service. So we want to be able to do that and to truly lift up holy hands in the sanctuary. So we've got to be free of these things that um, can so easily beset us. So have you ever offended someone <clears throat> and then wanted to be forgiven but was not? Tim Boom. That's when it rubber hits the road. Imagine her. Here she is. She's the teacher in this, at this, this uh, Bible study. Um, she's at this church and she's talking about this very subject. Only God could do this. She's talking about forgiveness. And then, the, and then here it is, the man who is so greatly offended to the point of her losing family members imprisoning her, humiliating her to the shame of being naked before him. And then he says, I want you to forgive me. I want to hear from your lips. I know God has forgiven me. I want to hear from your lips too. And I'm just reading these words and I'm thinking, did he say it smugly like that? <laughs> you want, you know, you kind of get this picture in your head like, really? Don't you say, you know, I know I don't deserve to be forgiven, to or to even ask you for this, but I am deeply sorry. Don't you say something? Um, but that God would have her talking about the very thing that He's going to ask her to do is to forgive. And, and you know, we know that, um, that we'll see out bear out in the scriptures that, um, and we've read a few of them that forgiveness has a lot to do with us, not the other person. It's us. It has a lot to do with us. If you hold it, we hold it. Somehow, we're the ones that's affected and not the other person. It's amazing how that happens. What is it? What is forgiveness? What is it? Assume that you need to borrow $100 to help pay a medical bill. You ask a friend for a loan and you promise to pay it back at the end of the month. But when the time comes for repayment, you don't have the money. In fact, for the next three months, you still don't have the money. Then unexpectedly, out of the kindness of his heart, your friend chooses to forgive the debt. Hmm. This is one facet of forgiveness. The Bible says, let no debt remain outstanding, except what? Except the continuing debt to love one another. Oh no man, nothing but love. Romans 13 and 8. So I can remember this actually happening even to myself. A friend of mine, a good friend, gave me an assignment to do, wanted me to uh, record um, one of the uh, Josh McDowell series, do a recording. So I, was, I started out doing the recording. Because he drives on a, a truck, he wanted to be able to listen to them because he was in school and he had to read this book, and he wanted me to record it on tape for him. Well, I started out doing a couple, and then life happened, and it wouldn't stop happening. And so I could never get back to completing a, a, a take to, to give to him. And the, the promise was, you do this, and I'll give you a whole set of Josh McDowell's uh, apologetic series, um, when critics ask, when cultists ask, when skeptics ask. So I really wanted that. And um, he said, I'll just give it to you if you do this for me. Well, what I did, you know, I was 
really crying out to God. I was feeling so bad. I'm like, oh my goodness, I'm not getting this done. And what am I going to find time? And every time I sit down to do it, it's something else. It seems like my life forever. It seems like that's going to be my life forever. <laughs> but what happened was awesome. What happened was my friend came over and he, and he said, oh, I came over and I felt so bad. I was like, oh no, he's here. And when he, I opened the door, he said that he met me with, um, well, the reason I stopped by was to tell you, he told me several things before this, but then he said, the reason I stopped by was to tell you that you don't have to do it. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to give you the set anyway. It was a load off of me. It was huge. It was like a, the, a, the, the avalanche that had fallen down on me was like a weight on my back had been lifted. It was such, it was liberating. It was, it was freedom and it was exhilarating and it was just awesome. I mean, awesome to the point that I had to bow down and to worship God because it's just what God does. He takes the debt off. He incurs the debt. Give me the debt. I'll pay it. Forgiveness is, again, dismissing a debt. In the New Testament, the Greek now, aphesis, denotes a dismissal or a release. So, when you think about something like that, you know, a lot of times, even going through life, the pressures, the pressures, the pressures are so great. The demands are unending, 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 and the trouble is constant and constant. And what we really, really want in that moment is relief. Relief. If somebody could just come around, and nobody can do it on this earth. There's not a man that's going to run for any office that's going to do that. The only person that can give us true relief from all the pressures in life is Jesus Christ. He's the only one. And so, you know, we, 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 we look at this forgiveness thing that we sometimes need. Actually, we need it a lot because every day in some kind of way we fall short of the glory of God. No matter how holy we think, we fall short every day in what we say and what we think and what we do. According to scripture, is even our righteousness is as filthy rags. So we're a piece of work. We're a work in progress. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank God for Jesus. Again, what are some of the things that really make forgiving difficult? What is it? What, what's so hard about it? What's the hardest thing about forgiving? Pride. Mm. Hurt. Hurt. Pride. Maybe the other person's posture, them taking, I don't know about you, but maybe them taking for granted the fact that forgiveness means they didn't do anything wrong, which is an oxymoron in itself, but some people act like that, you know, um, because the mere fact of you having to forgive somebody says that you did something. But sometimes people act like, yeah, because I didn't do anything really wrong, right? And it makes mm -hmm. it hard to forgive. <laughs> I know for me, again, it's, it's the thing whereby, you know, real forgiveness uh, or, well, because forgiveness really is from us, true forgiveness has come from us. And it is, I think those two main things that you mentioned are really good. You said pride and you said hurt. Hurt is a big factor for most of us. We're hurt. We're so hurt that it's difficult to give something to somebody that you feel they don't deserve. And really, what we want to do. We want to pay them back. We want them to pay. We want them to hurt too. Jesus expressed the heart of forgiveness when he said these words. Love your enemies. Do good to those who, what? Hate you. Listen, you know, I, I hear all the time that Christianity is for what? Wimps, the weak, that kind of thing. We people can't do this. <laughs> we have to be, we can't do this in the natural. This takes supernatural strength to love those who do what? Hate me? I've got to love the person that hates me? Really? But this is the high call of being a Christian. It's not for the weak, it's for those who are strong in the Lord and the power of his might, who put on the full armor of God so that they're able to stand the wiles of the devil. Luke 6 and 27, though, tells us to love our enemies. That's a, that's, 
I'm like, Jesus, come on, can you write something else? <laughs> can you tell, can you give us a, some, a little leeway here? <laughs> but no, he's not telling us to do anything he hasn't done and he doesn't do. He's telling us to do what he did for us. Love your enemies. Who are we? His enemies at one time. Forgiveness is dismissing your demand that others owe you something. And this is where we need to really take and examine ourselves. We want someone else to pay. Remember that scripture in the uh, Gospels where the, uh, the debtor goes and pleads, uh, the, well, he's, yeah, he's in debt. He pleads for mercy because he owes this debt and he's released of this debt. But then he goes right out to his brother and chokes him by the neck and says, pay up. That's us. When we insist that somebody needs to pay up the debt that they owe us, it is a very, it, it, I'm telling you, this is not easy, right? It's not easy. And so, but it's right in our face that either we are doers of his word or hearers only, deceiving ourselves at times. And this is one of those areas that it comes around. We don't get to pick when it comes. <laughs> We don't get to choose if it comes. You know, I would say, ah, I think I'll bypass that one. I don't want to deal with that. But it comes. And then we have the choice. Choose you this day who you will serve. Will you serve the Lord with your life, not just your lips, to lay your life down, to let God show up in your situation, hands and feet, breathing and walking through you. The amazing grace, amazing grace of God that we get, that we get to do his word, to show him that we love him. As Jesus said, if you love me, this is how you show me you love me. Not by your lips, with your life. Keep my commandments. Do what I say. Then you prove to me you love me. This is what speaks to me all the time. It's a hard thing. It's a hard thing. And you just say, okay, God. I do love you. Help me in this moment to do exactly what you want me to do. Help me to crucify my flesh right now, mm -hmm. hanging on the cross. You see me? That's what I tell him. I tell him, like, you see me? Crucifying it. It hurts. I don't want to do this. Being honest with it. I don't want to do it. But I will do it because I do love you. And I want you to know it. It's a hard thing, though. It's hard to forgive people who don't deserve forgiveness. It's very difficult. It's hard. Um, and I think it's on purpose. <laughs> so we can get an idea of what he did for us. We don't deserve to be forgiven. We need to know the magnitude of our, the greatness of our lawlessness, the greatness of our sinfulness, the greatness our, of our demise, of our our, our, our estate of sin and death is great. And we see it, we can see it clearer in another brother. I'm, I'm often, it, it's very perplexing to me that if we didn't have any reflections around in the world, no mirrors, nothing, we would never know what we look like. Only you would know what I look like. <laughs> Only I would know what you look like. That's amazing to me. I can't see myself, can't do it, unless I put up a reflection, the mirror so I can see myself clearly. It is the law of the word. I can't see myself. My behavior, I can't really see it as well unless I'm looking in the mirror, the law of his word, to see where I am, who I am, how I am, where I am with him. But it's dismissing our demand that others owe us something, especially when they fail to meet Notice this, which she writes here. Your expectations. They fail to meet our expectations, so we demand they pay up. But do we want to be on that same kind of hook? We forget we're reaping what we sow. We forget that. We reap what we sow, and we always get a greater harvest than the seed. One little seed, big harvest. So we got to watch how we sow. 
in what we sow because the harvest is coming. God won't be mocked. He tells us that in Galatians 5. So, when a person fails to meet our expectations and fail to keep a promise, when we fail to keep a promise, we fail to treat or fail to treat you justly. We want to be treated justly. But sometimes, the thing that we complain about, the script, I really am humbled by that scripture that says the very thing that you complain about and somebody else, you yourself are guilty of it. If so, somebody could turn around and say, but you do that, you've done that. But we see it again. Who sees us better? Only when we can see it. I, now I know what I look like. I don't know, unless I have a mirror up, I don't know what I look like right now. I know what I looked like <laughs> some time ago when I was in the mirror, but right now I don't have no idea. So hopefully everything's in place. But it could not, it could be out of place. But I do know the same it goes with my with my spiritual man. I don't know how he looks really, unless I care to. Take the time, look into God's word and see myself. Or hear from one of his who will tell me how it is I look. So here, Jesus said, if someone strikes you on the right cheek, see, here he goes again. Turn to him the other also. So it's, in other words, don't take revenge. He didn't say hit him back. Don't take revenge is really what he's telling us not to do. There's three levels. I like um, something that Adrian Rogers um, used to say. Three ways, three levels in which we live. And it's a choice each time. The world, oh, we'll do, do good to you because you do good to me. Or Satan's level, I'm going to do good, evil to you even though you do good to me, which is really going on quite a bit now. But we're called to live on the higher level. To do good to those who do evil to us. And it is really a high call that takes supernatural strength. We give God our natural, he meets us with his super. <laughs> the only way it works. Forgiveness is dismissing, canceling, or setting someone free from the consequence of falling short of God's standard. I'll read that one more time. Forgiveness is dismissing, canceling, or setting someone free from the consequence of falling short of God's standard. Notice it's not our standard. She correctly writes here. It is God's standard. We can't have people trying to live up to our standards. It has to be God's standard. Not a subjective, but an objective standard. The holy standard of God is perfect, and that's the reason why we refer to his standard and not ours. Ours is not perfect. But his standard is perfect, yet we all have sinned. The penalty for our sins is spiritual death, which is to be separated from God eternally. The penalty for our sins, our debt, was paid by Jesus Christ through his sacrificial death on the cross, which we we know and we adore him for that therefore instead of being separated from God we can have our debt dismissed by God and experience eternal life in heaven that's what we get that's not what we deserve and I'm always always amazed at the fact that God does not give us what we deserve <laughs> But instead, he gives us what we need, mercy and grace. Pour it out new every morning. As a matter of fact, every, situ every moment of the day, grace and mercy that we need. Does that mean that we're, li our lives are trouble-free? No, but it's grace and mercy is there. If you want to look for it, you can see it. You can see it. Thank you, Father, for just this little snippet, this introduction to the study of forgiveness. 
so that we can better understand what it is you've required, what it is you're calling us to do, what it is that you have done. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to be uh, vessels of honor, living epistles, willing servants, yielded to your Holy Spirit. Please make it so. Help us and bless us, Lord God, to grow abundantly and be happy doers of your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.